Welcome to the Carter Center's Roundtable Discussion, Moral Imagination in Crisis, Building a More Equal World for All, featuring an invigorating and wonderful conversation between media executive and author and women's leadership advocate, Pat Mitchell, and author and CEO of Acumen, Jacqueline Novogratz, whom Pat will introduce more fully in a moment. First, let me offer my greetings to our global audience from all of us here at the Carter Center. It is a great pleasure to be able to connect with each of you during this very challenging time. You are all in our hearts and thoughts as we make our way through this crisis, which is also an unprecedented opportunity to reimagine our world and think together about the world we wanna to create together. When Jimmy Carter, founder of the Carter Center, was president of the United States, he signed several global human rights treaties, sending a signal to the world that the United States was committed to the implementation of the tenets of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, from civil and political rights to economic, social, and cultural rights. For several years, the Carter Center's Human Rights De Defenders Forum has explored in particular the challenge of growing inequality and the need to realize economic rights along with political rights. This is why this topic and Ms. Novogratz's book is so timely for us to discuss together. This book is filled with inspiring examples of how human creativity combined with economic and financial incentives has resulted in innovations that have really improved people's lives. It's a primer for individual action that can help us expand our moral imagination in a way that can really change the world for the better. And Ms. Novogratz also raises the vital question about how to balance market forces and unbridled capitalism on the one hand with the proper role of government. As the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated in stark relief, the consequences of the concentration of wealth at the top through tax policy, along with inadequate public investment in institutions that pro protect public health. And without universal healthcare as a human right, it is clear that we must rebalance priorities and approaches. Some countries like Spain and Portugal are, are already taking steps like establishing a universal basic income, reversing austerity programs and reinvesting in people in a way that is compatible with a thriving private enterprise environment. It is well past time to ask ourselves this question that economist Dr. Radhika Balakrishnan has posed to us, who and what is the economy for? If not for human well-being, what purpose does it serve? There are growing calls now, especially now, for the recognition of healthcare, housing, clean water, high quality food and education as human rights. We have the opportunity to rally our communities and our elected officials to translate the promises of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt, the great, great leader, uh, one of the first wonderful public women leaders of our country brought into being through her brilliance, bringing that declaration into reality. Today's conversation will be the first in a series about this question, what would a moral economy look like? And I welcome Pat Mitchell, chair of the Sundance Institute board, curator of TED Women, first woman president and CEO of PBS and the indefatigable champion and convener of women leaders and a very good friend of mine uh, to bring us our program today. Pat, over to you. Thank you so much, Karen, for that very warm welcome and for setting the foundation for this conversation. And it seems entirely right to convene a conversation about a moral revolution with the Carter Center, whose work continues the work of a leader always guided by a strong moral compass, work that Karen, you continue, and whose presidency is, as Karen referenced, made peace, security, and human rights the keystone values of his leadership. So Thank you, Pat, and I will see you at the end of the program. I'm gonna leave it up to you to, to host our conversation. See you soon. Thank you very much, Karen. I want to express gratitude to you, to President Carter, and to this community of leaders and peacemakers and change agents who have joined us from all over the world. 
And we're very privileged to have a conversation today with a leader whose work is also guided by a set of values, principles that she articulates in her new book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. This is a book that I hope will start a revolution, a revolution of much needed changes at just the time when the world needs a complete reset of everything, from values to priorities, practices, and policies. If you read one book this summer, and I urge you to put this one on your list, it's an urgently needed restoration of mind and spirit, as well as guidance forward through these challenging times. Welcome, please, with me, Jacqueline Novogratz. Thanks Jacqueline. so much, Pat. Thank Thanks you, the, the, the Carter Center. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline, for this very well-timed and mm -hmm. much needed manifesto for a moral revolution. And let's begin our conversation right there. What do you mean by moral? Thanks, Pat. And thanks for everything that you do. Um, by moral, I don't mean a set of prescribed rules handed down by um, an authority from above. What I mean um, in this interdependent world when we have so many competing belief systems, cultures, ways of being, we have to agree on a common framework that puts our shared humanity, which includes the sustainability of the earth at the center. And so if we're starting with a common belief in human dignity, then we have to be willing to embrace the discomfort of navigating between these different tensions. And so that for me is the moral. It is the, the immutable belief in our interconnectedness, indeed our interdependence, focusing on human dignity and then doing the work to, to hold these different truths in tension. And what you're describing is in great contrast to the way the world works <laughs> and works right now, mm -hmm. uh, the way democracy is working or not working, and certainly the way the economy is working and not working. So you're talking about a completely different system as well as balance. Um, and how do you envision that going forward? Pat, you don't start with the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I mean, and that was where I was very deliberate in choosing the word moral uh, revolution. Um, thinking about forces, not from the top nor from the bottom, but those forces that come from within each of us. Our systems have become so entangled, so complicated that there is no sim silver bullet, no linear fix to solving our problems. As you said so eloquently, every one of our systems is broken whether it's our health system, our education system, our food system, our criminal justice system, the, the nationalism and the globalism. And yet we've got to find a way to navigate these because they're all also entangled. And so for me, the way we start to create that change is to work from a place of moral leadership, become role models who build business models. And I'm not just talking about for-profit businesses, whether we're in government, civil society, or the private sector. And my theory of change is then based on this network, we all help each other change our systems. I don't, I can't think of another way, Pat, um, than one that starts with all of us. And you started and launched such a new system or approach to the way the economy could work. Um, when you found it Acumen. Mm. And even though the book is not specifically about Acumen, it is about a world that begins with a different set of values, as you suggest, a different set of priorities. And by the investments that Acumen has made in the great thinkers, risk takers, innovators, right, who are out there doing just this, challenging unbridled capitalism, um, you, you give us stories in the book that lead us to believe it can work. There can be a moral revolution. Perhaps we start with, with sharing one of the stories from the book that, that shows how you put this into practice. 
Thanks, Pat. Yeah, it's really 35 years of doing this work and recognizing that we have it within us to create not just organizations or companies, but systemic change. We just can't do it in isolation. Probably the best story, which I would call our impact unicorn, is a company called Delight, which essentially starts with two kids still in business school, um, one of whom had been in Peace Corps for five years, who decided that they wanted to eradicate kerosene because a billion and a half people around the world 10 years ago still had no access to electricity and were dependent on kerosene. Crazy audacious idea for two kids who had never built a business before, um, but they understood that if they were going to get the kind of capital and scale that was required, they would try this as a for-profit model. Um, they came to us with this idea and because they had the right character, because Sam Goldman had been in Peace Corps for five years, had immersed himself in an unelectrified village, understood how low-income people made decisions, we took a bet, patient capital, long-term capital. We broke all the rules of capitalism in this way, 10 to 15 years, any money that came back got reinvested. We learned over time that capital by itself is not enough. So we had to bring in a lot of talent. We had to use our social connections and networks to connect them to corporations, to grant makers, so that they could actually understand how the poor made decision, price things to make it affordable, frankly, useful in ways that low-income people could value. And it's a long, hard story, not an easy story, but thus recently they've announced um, that they brought light and electricity to 100 million low-income people around the world. That then sets off the energy revolution, which now constitutes about 350,000 jobs in 500 companies. So you start to see that we can solve our problems in ways that create jobs, that enable other stakeholders like the climate to be protected and long-term can also provide a fair financial return or economic return to those investors. We just have to do things differently. And Acumen's at the model for that. Um, over the years, as I sat in the boardroom of Acumen, which I was very privileged to serve as a trustee, um, I want to assure those listening to us today that this is not an unusual story. This is not an exception, uh, Daylight. There, there's been more than almost a billion dollars of patient capital that Acumen has put into the marketplace and more than 300 million people, low-income communities that have been served. So this is not an exception. This proves uh, that it can work. And one of the ways that I think Acumen empowers this, Jacqueline, is because you're so clear about what the goals and the purpose is so clear about the values. And that for me was articul articulated best in the manifesto. Would you mind, I, I just feel that sort of sets the tone for a lot of the rest of our conversation is to understand how Acumen makes the decisions it makes about where it places its funds and where it develops its leadership. Absolutely. And thank you, um, and Pat. And as I find it, to your point, Again, when I, I think when we use the word moral, so often people think, oh, it's spiritual, it's religious, it's soft. The moral that I'm talking about is a hard-edged hope. It's a hard-edged sense of what it means to be connected. And so it requires the head and the heart. Um, so here's our manifesto, um, which we wrote really to articulate our moral compass. It starts by standing with the poor, listening to voices unheard and recognizing potential where others see despair. It demands investing as a means, not an end, daring to go where markets have failed and aid has fallen short. It makes capital work for us, not control us. It thrives on moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is, the audacity to imagine what it could be. It's having the ambition to learn at the edge, the wisdom to admit failure, the courage to try again. It requires patience and kindness, resilience and grit, a hard-edged hope. It's leadership that rejects complacency, breaks through bureaucracy and challenges corruption, 
doing what's right, not what's easy. It's the radical idea of creating hope in a cynical world, changing the way the world tackles poverty, building a world based on dignity. Every time I hear this, I, um, I see you, Jacqueline, um, as well as all of the entrepreneurs and leaders that you and Acumen have developed. But you stand for this. You uh, live this manifesto. And I want to take the group who joined us today who may not know so much of your story back to how this came into your life. Because if you look at the beginning of your work life, it it wouldn't ordinarily point <laughs> to this is the direction for a leader guided by moral imagination. Um, mm -hmm. You began as a banker. Um, so what did you learn or experience in that beginning that led you to this place of envisioning an entirely different way for the markets to work? Thanks, Pat. And, and I try to live up to it. I think that part of the humility that we need in our leaders is to recognize that we don't always um, always live up to every word of it. But the, the beginning, I would say I was an accidental banker in that um, I didn't really wanna be a banker, but I got a job at a bank that took me to 40 countries and I did want to be a traveler and understand the world. I loved the world and our family didn't have the kind of, or really, much money at all. So I was never able to leave the United States until I got this job. And what I saw turned out that I loved the tools of banking. I loved how numbers could tell a story. I loved what it meant to invest in someone's energy that would then release the energy of others. Didn't love how the poor were excluded and, um, and how that many didn't have the confidence nor were welcome to walk through the doors of banks. That set me off on a journey that ended up in Central Africa where I started a microfinance bank in Rwanda. Um, and I saw the power there of giving women access to markets, as Amartya Sen would say, the economist, as a form of freedom. Now they had choice, they had opportunity. And I saw the limitations of markets there, but I also saw the limitations of aid. Top down, you know, the question of who decides what people get. Um, and I saw before the genocide what, what demagogues can do in times of great insecurity, particularly when people can't decide for themselves. And that really helped me understand why dignity was more important. That is the opposite of poverty, not just income. And we make a mistake when we think that while I'm a complete believer in universal basic income, as one element, I loved how Karen said, we need political rights and we need economic rights. Mm -hmm. and that sent me on this path to think about, well, what if we thought of capital just as a tool? How would we structure it to give entrepreneurs who are seekers like me, the opportunity to try and understand pers the perspectives of low-income people and then build solutions in ways that allowed them to solve their own problems so they could decide. And that was the beginning of Acumen. And the lessons that you learned from starting a business in Rwanda after leaving banking have been, re have been captured in a best-selling book called Blue Sweater, which I wanna add to the list of <laughs> must reads. Uh, you are of the best PR agent I could ever well, have. Well, it, 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 but it is absolutely true. I speak from, from the heart. Um, but you, you have in this model turned capitalism sort of upside down. Um, this certainly disrupted uh, all the ways that the current economic systems and even democracy seem to work, which always seems to be in favor of the wealthy and not standing with the poor. I, I was struck by a, a Nigerian businessman's quote to you once when he challenged you by saying all of this that you believe, uh, you're, you're too old. What he said, you're too old to be that idealistic about Africa. How did you respond to him at that time? Well, to set the table, literally, there were 18 West Africans, mostly Nigerians and me and a young woman from my team. And it was the wrong night for sure. And I think, you know, thinking about who is on this call, how many of us have been 
put into that corner of naive, idealist, um, when, you know, we're, we are, but you don't make change and you don't create organizations that reach hundreds of millions of people if you're not also super realistic and gritty. And on this particular night, um, I was so shocked that I was a woman of my 40s that I would be asked this question um, that I was like, well, you know, I could tell you all these other stories um, that have equally been true in my life around corruption and incompetence and extortion, the times I've been attacked, what it meant to love people that both were murdered and part of planning a genocide. I could tell you a lot of the ugly, but I don't think that's very inspiring. Instead, let me tell you that there are many stories to each of us as human beings, to every country, including my own. I'd much rather tell you the stories of Nollywood and how Kenya has leapfrogged the West in terms of mobile banking and the other technologies that are being used by smallholder farmers and my neighbors in New York aren't even using them. I would rather tell you the stories of forgiveness and resilience and philosophers and scientists and teachers and entrepreneurs. And I really got out of control um, that night, but it really made clear to me that I have worked in many countries in the world. I learned, I really grew up in so many ways, as you know, Pat, in different countries in Africa, because that is where I learned that until you accept in another human being, in a community, in yourself, that we are all as humans, we have the dark and we have the light and you learn to love it, not in an easy way, but in a way that recognizes that real love is a hard skill. And that then once you embrace that and you have the resiliency to do this for not two years or five years, but in my case, 35. And I feel like, I hope I am only halfway there. Um, that's when you make the change. And um, the good news was by the end of the night, a number of those individuals um, became acumen partners and um, become wonderful friends and advisors. Well, the best pushback on skepticism and cynicism is evidence, right? And that's acumen, right, Pat. Yeah, and acumen has provided that evidence by being able to point to these social enterprises that are delivering products and services to those uh, who need it most and are succeeding. Part of what I've always described as acumen's secret sauce, however, is that you don't just give financial support because that really has never been enough. You give the leadership support that unleashes these social entrepreneurs to actually work from their moral imagination. And each of them, you, you've extracted values that comprise what a moral revolution look like, looks like. Um, let's talk a little bit about what those values are, things that you have observed in these leaders of these social enterprises. Um, the, the value that we talk about the most, which is the title of this, um, this is moral imagination, this ability, humility to see the world as it is. In other words, show me that you have immersed that you really understand how the communities that you want to serve actually operate. Um, and tell me what you want to do. And if you cannot articulate clearly either and both, we're not going to invest. So the moral imagination that starts with empathy, but it doesn't end with empathy because you and I've talked about this, empathy alone reinforces the status quo. It's too much like sympathy and feeling sorry for. Empathy must move to immersion or proximity, get close to the problem, designed from the perspective of low-income people. Then analyze the systemic forces that actually have helped to create that situation and then act. Um, so moral imagination. Connected to that obviously is deep listening. A third is um, identity not in a way that div divides. We've seen identity in our lifetime weaponized, um, but in a way that understands that we are all comprised of multiple identities and that we use these different component parts of ourselves as a way of connecting. 
So identity. Um, I've already mentioned holding opposing truths without rejecting either. We're in this moment of COVID, <clears throat> where it's health or the economy, um, where it's climate change or health. It is at the interstices. The either or negates our ability as human beings to create solutions that are truly inclusive and truly sustainable. It's much less comfortable when you don't have a single bottom line, but we've got to get a lot better whether we're starting, whether we're running an organization, a community, a school or a business, um, and certainly a nation at holding those tensions. Because right now we're not getting anything done because one, we're standing on one side or the other. So we look for that and then, um, um, I could go on, but as you know, accompaniment. One thing to give people opportunity, if you are not enabling them to have the capability to make use of that opportunity, doesn't really matter. And so um, we have come, Pat, to, to recognize that we can structure the right kind of capital, but the secret sauce of the companies that, of the entrepreneurs that don't just build solutions for a few, but actually change systems is character. And we are witnessing the way in which many of these entrepreneurs have changed systems. Uh, even now, uh, at the, it seems at this time, everything is in high relief, right? And I am impressed in the book by how each of the stories illustrates these values, which can be sustained through tough times, like the ones we have now. But you also share how these entrepreneurs have pivoted in this time of COVID. You know, share one of the stories I, I'm struck by. I think it was one of the entrepreneurs in India who completely looked at COVID as the risk, of course, yes, to the work, but as an opportunity to do something different. Yeah, I mean, it has been incredible to see that, that again, sometimes people look at the, the 12 principles of the books as soft skills, listening, identity, accompaniment. Um, I increasingly see them as operating principles for an interdependent world. And they are hard skills. But more than that, as you said, Pat, these skills came out of resource constrained environment. You build a company in India or Pakistan or, or Kenya or Nigeria, and stuff is happening to you all the time. And it is these values that enable you to navigate all those tensions. So COVID, is actually while I'm seeing some of the ugliest behavior and treatment and fears that people have for good reasons, I'll, I am also seeing a, an explosion of creativity and change um, and an acceleration of trends that we've been talking about for a long time that give me real hope for the future. Um, in India, we have a young woman named Sohani Mohan um, who recognize the issue of menstruation and its particularly adverse impact on many, many low-income women across more traditional parts of India. And she decided to do something about it. She really did turn capitalism on its head by creating a, a distributed manufacturing model. In other words, rather than having a centralized factory where she made all the sanitary napkins, she sold mini factories to villages and far-flung areas, some of which are very difficult to reach in the rainy season, particularly with climate change. So you see this confluence. And, um, and now she has about 40 factories up and running. She sold like 6 million of these sanitary napkins. Um, she lets the individual factories and villages brand for themselves because there's so little trust in those areas of outsiders. So really breaking all the rules. COVID happens. And now you've got a thriving business working with some of the most marginalized women. And, and that gets compounded by lockdown in India where if you leave your home during the day and particularly in low income slum areas, people are beaten. And so now she's got to figure out how do you pivot? And she decides that um, if she can find a more centralized factory, she can change and um, have women manufacture masks and makes a connection with Mahindra, one of the largest manufacturing, car manufacturing and truck manufacturing companies in the world. 
based, excuse me, based in Bombay. And, um, and that she can bring women to the factory where they can live and be safe. And I've just watched her pivot. Meanwhile, she's gone to government to change their definition because in the beginning of lockdown, um, women's menstrual health products were not considered essential. Go figure. Now they have been because so, so honey fought for it. And I have so many examples like that across India, Pakistan, as I said, every country in which we're operating, including the United States. Sometimes when people hear about Acumen's entrepreneurs and their success stories there, you know, they want to say, well, it happens because of this, this and this. But in fact, it has happened in some of the most politically challenging situations. I'm thinking of Pakistan and other places where you have, as a leader yourself, Jacqueline, been challenged to stand firm uh, by the values and principles that you believe in and that these entrepreneurs and their businesses represent. How do you navigate that? How do you hold those tensions when you're fighting for the very survival of these social enterprises? Um, I think, I think Pat, what we were talking about before, and, and I think this is where being a woman actually helps because particularly women of my generation and your generation, um, no matter whether we were privileged or not, and I certainly never considered myself privileged growing up, there's a part of you that feels like the outsider um, and that is often treated as an outsider. And so for people who are, whose self-perception is of being an outsider, you have to learn how the system works. Um, often better than people for whom the system works because they take it for granted. And then you have to learn how to navigate it. But the superpower that you have, if you take that outsider status and understand the insider realities, is that if, and you don't forget what it feels like to be an outsider, is that you can extend your knowledge to those who are truly outsiders now. And so in this moment of interdependence, I think we, the, the people who have many layers of feeling the outsider have more of an advantage to use those pieces of their identity for change. And so if I'm working in, a, in a, an incredibly difficult political situation and, and painful often situation, staying with my North Star, knowing that I made a commitment to show up to do the right thing, not the easy thing, never shaming, um, but speaking the truth in ways that other people can hear. And, um, and again, holding those tensions between the humility and the audacity um, and then never giving up. And I think over time, you know, we're now in Pakistan um, 19 years. I've, gone to the country two to three, sometimes more times every single year. And I've been to all parts of the country. It is so clear that I love the people of that country. And, um, and I never assumed I was a local. I always thought I was a guest. And I think in a way that I earned um, somehow that people do treat me as a local. Yeah. And that has helped me feel more confident in speaking truth, Pat. And I think that these are also leadership qualities that we don't talk about enough, but they're so essential right now as we, have, as we have to learn to navigate, not just lines of difference in Kumbaya ways, but serious lines of difference where they're all trust for many good reasons has been eviscerated. Let's go back a little earlier in this journey that led you to be this extraordinary leader that you are today. You grew up in a large and boisterous Catholic family as the oldest, uh, high achieving family, I should say too. Uh, and you write in the book about being fascinated by the saints when you were a little girl being taught by nuns. So what was it about the stories of those saints that inspired the young Jacqueline? You know, I actually was given a gift by the poet Marie Howe recently, Pat, when I when we were laughing that all, why was it that good little Catholic girls um, who went to Catholic schools loved the saints? And she said, you know, Jacqueline, 
the saints were the first women who actually wrote the stories of their own narratives. They took control. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was such an insight for me. And as I got older, I realized that they were also the first human beings that I had come to know of that lived and sometimes died for ideas that were bigger than they, they were. And, um, and they were fierce and they were clear and they were leaders. And, uh, and I'm really glad I used to read those stories. <laughs> and I don't think you wanted to become a nun, but you've certainly taken uh, writing the narrative of your own life. And definitely, do you agree? Uh, yeah, and I think I had those models in as as a as a as a little girl, tiny little girl. And then, as Karen said, you know, we had Eleanor Roosevelt, Harriet Tubman. Yeah, I had these little books when I was a seven seven year old and a ten year old that um, were the biographies. And I don't really remember. I'm sure there were biographies of men, but I wanted to be like those women yeah. um, who were unafraid. And um, the power of narrative, the power of stories, Pat. And you were honored recently for the power of your narrative uh, by the Eleanor Roosevelt uh, Center. And I know she's one of the women that you admire and often quote as you are uh, teaching leadership. Uh, as you were doing. Uh, what, what was it about her and about the other leaders that are all a part of uh, the Leadership Academy that uh, Acumen offers? How, what, what draws you in to each of those stories? What is about the narrative that compels you? Um, the narrative that compels me is that change is possible and that change is the domain of all of us. And so whenever I go to visit one of Acumen 700 fellows around the world um, or our 130 companies, I insist on going to the, the villages where they operate, the slums in which they employ people. And I am interested in talking to the entrepreneur, but I, I also want to talk to their team. I want to talk to their customers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've learned along the way is that, um, and this goes back to change being the domain of all of us is how many of the, the employees and the customers become change agents themselves because they've been given an opportunity. And that's what I put into the book often. A woman named Everlyn, who is, was a delight um, sales agent essentially. So she would go door to door selling these solar home systems. And um, when I asked her, what her dreams were. She was such an impressive young woman. She said, um, well, first, I come from one of the most traditional tribes in Kenya, um, one that where most every girl um, has genital, genital cutting and doesn't go to school. And I'm so proud of it, but I'm also ashamed of this identity. And so my first goal is to make sure that my village of 500 homes all have electricity. Then I want to go to university and start a business. And I thought, you know, I was raised on the American dream. You could be anything you want to be. And it was such a gift. But somehow that American dream got a little perverted. And it was go and get rich and successful. And then you can do good stuff with the money that you've earned. And here was this youngster with the an African dream, which was I want to serve my community. Then I want to focus on myself. And so I think that what I love, Pat, are these leaders who are redefining success away from what has too dominated our world, money, power, and fame, to um, giving more to the world than you take, to how much energy do we release in others, to a system that puts humanity in the earth at the center and not just money. And the fact that I get, I've known, I've worked with now almost a thousand, as you say, this is not a one-off situation. This is about changing health systems, food systems, electricity systems in ways that at the end of the day, government really notices. And if you forgive me, 
going back to that idealism question, I've been thinking about Gandhi recently and um, he had this wonderful quote, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I've been speaking to a lot of university kids lately and I keep saying to them, I'd be lying if I said that this road of change is easy, it's hard and it's long. Um, but not only is there beauty along the way, but you do it long enough, you make the change that you believe that you could make. And that is why I love women like Eleanor Roosevelt and frankly, Pat Mitchell, that is why I love you. You only get more energized and you only renew. And um, that's the kind of, and for that, you've been a role model and a mentor in my life. Thank you for that, Jacqueline. That touches me deeply. But every time I hear you talk, I think of another great American leader who had a big dream, um, the amazing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who put all of this that we've been talking about today into that one, uh, those three words that you also talk about at the end of the book, the beautiful struggle. Talk mm -hmm. to me about that, what that means in your life, the beautiful struggle and in your work. Thank you, Pat. And um, my goodness, even a mere shadow, not even a mere shadow of, of King. And, and you think about, you know, can one human being change the world? And he didn't just change it in the United States, but for the whole world and every generation since. And I have sung, We Shall Overcome with women in India um, and in many, many different cultures, South Africa. Um, and one of the things that King said in 1968 at Riverside Church in one of the last speeches of his life, where he actually talked about the Vietnam War and, and bucked the status quo even of his own people because they were like, wait, you're a civil rights leader. Now you're getting into global human rights and, and politics. And he was like, look, I have the Nobel Prize with privilege comes responsibility. So we stand on his shoulders, but he talked about the long and bitter but beautiful struggle. And what that made me think about is beauty as part of struggle. And I think it's a secret we don't talk about as activists, as change makers, that um, in this work, particularly with low income populations, particularly when we're trying to change is beauty. And in the darkest times, there's something in the human spirit that creates even more beauty if you look for it. Um, we're seeing it now with COVID and the poetry and the singing that is just happening spontaneously. Every slum I've ever been in has brought me extraordinary surprises in the color and the, in the way people dress up for you and in flowers and coffee cans. Um, but it's deeper than that. There's beauty in the way that we can pay attention to each other, the way that we show up. There is beauty in resistance. And the more that we hold that beauty, the more we can sustain. Um, in fact, I can't think of another way to sustain. And of course, all of us define where we find beauty in different ways. But the more we can hold that and embrace the beautiful part of this, I think the more we can reflect our own beauty back to the world. Um, Many of us come into this work because we want to heal our own broken parts. But this is about finding our beauty to reflect so that we can help other people reflect theirs. I, I, I'm so tempted to just say namaste, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and just repeat all of that again, um, because that is the moral revolution, uh, stepping into the beautiful struggle. And I want to bring in another extraordinary leader, Karen, who began this day with us, this conversation, uh, to, care, to invite Karen and the people who have had the privilege of hearing this conversation, Jacqueline, to ask a couple of questions in the minutes we have left. Karen? Thank you, Pat. And thank you, Jacqueline. That was a really, really fascinating and inspiring discussion. And um, I have uh, Dr. Radhika Balakrishnan, who I quoted at the beginning, was watching. And uh, she texted me and said, oh, please ask this question. So, um, but before I do, I want to just pick up on what you were just talking about, about Dr. King. 
in that very speech, I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's one of my favorite speeches. Mm, Dr. King, because at the end of his life, what was he talking about? He realized that political rights and civil rights as essential as they are without economic rights and without a, a, a balancing, a moral balancing are only get us only part of the way. So he started the Poor People's Campaign and the moral movement for a united approach to human rights. So in that speech, he said that any country who spends more on war than on social uplift has a spiritual disease. It's a spiritual problem and it, and it requires us to come together as a nation to address it. You know, and he went and he marched with the sanitation workers. What did he ask for? Wages and worker protections. Sanitation workers had been killed in the, in the trucks where they were, didn't have proper protections. So at the end of his life, he, he sort of pointed us in that direction. And so Radhika's question is very much along those lines. You know, even as we, you give this, in, and in your book, uh, I really recommend folks read the book because there are really inspiring stories about people who have marshaled the creativity that patient capital, as you say, which I love that phrase, can, can uh, unleash in a community. Now we, what we have to do is match that with the proper role of the state. What we have seen over the last 40 years has been really the collapse of the regulatory framework of the, of the responsibility of the state to protect human rights, to make sure that there is a tax base that can meet the social needs, et cetera. So Radhika's question is about this, is what from your, because you have this experience of bringing the private sector and the private public sector together, shouldn't we be really thinking boldly now that the state must play a more robust role in terms of tax policy? I mean, when you look at the wealth and how it has gone, you know, before from World War II until about 1981, there was shared prosperity in America. After that, you see this huge gap, wealth gap growing where the tax base just completely shifted. So tax policy, but also investment in public infrastructure, investment in public health, hello. Um, so what is your, what have you learned um, in your work with really injecting some, because really you said individually, yes, individually, we are also citizens. So we must demand more of our governments. I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, Karen. And here again is where I would say, it's not either or, it has to be both and. Um, and here again is where I think the moral component is so critical because I have lived and worked where government ostensibly provides all of the services, but you have such moral corruption with those commitments Mm -hmm. that this is one of the reasons that people in the developing world have so embraced capitalism. It's like, just leave us on our own. This is why so many people in, in places like India and Pakistan, where there is a right to public education are going into starting these low income. And so when I look at um, the US for instance, I'm a complete believer in a single payer system for healthcare not just in one country, but like you started at the beginning, universal health insurance, universal health care is something that we need to get to as a world. There's no doubt in my mind and we need to fight for it. But even if we had a single payer system in the US, um, I was talking to one of our entrepreneurs, um, Manik Bhatt, who's an, a Kashmiri immigrant who started a company after working in Baltimore and seeing what keeps us so unhealthy as a nation in the United States. Yes, it's our overall health system, but he made the decision and the, drew the conclusion that it's also about the social determinants of health. We have a whole housing system where people have lead in their walls, lead in their water. We've got such high levels of stress because the jobs that people have not only are not valued, but do not pay and many are, are if they have jobs, um, are working multiple. Like I said before, our criminal justice system, the loneliness that has come with the individualism that can't just be blamed on government policies or market policies. There is, a, 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 this is where I come back to that commingling. So even if we went to a single payer system, which I absolutely believe, so hear me correctly, 
um, with you. We need to fight for it as citizens. We still would have a major health debacle in the United States. We have to change our healthy, our, our you know, our, our obesity levels, our education systems, our food systems, every other system as well. So with me, it's always yes and, but it comes down to, it's not just about fighting for systems. It's ensuring that we have the right leaders with the right character and we hold them accountable. It's easy for me, easy, nothing's easy, but when you have a community of individuals and acumen fellows working government, um, private sector and in the um, public sector, I mean, in the civil society, I can call these kids up and say like, you've signed on to the manifesto and you're not upholding those. Um, that's harder to do and we're not doing it as nations. We need to do more of it, but we all need to lean into it as well. Um, one, again, in this moment of COVID, Karen, something that's really excited me is we had a, a young guy in, um, in our Pakistan program, um, Abdal, who, um, who was frustrated with government and education. Um, and his fellow fellows goaded him to joining government. He became an advisor to the Ministry of Education in Punjab, which has 12 million public school students in it and another six to seven million who don't go to school at all. And another 12 million in the kind of schools I was describing for the, for the very poor, but technically private schools. And um, so when lockdown happened, now he's in charge of, um, from the government, finding a way to get these kids educated and he pulls together um, using all of these tools and skills, he told me, uh, private sector players, cable television companies and um, um, radio stations and uh, nonprofits that are doing ed tech. And within 10 days, they built a, ca a cable television station and a radio and um, apps for kids that do have internet, which isn't very many of them. And, and the government is seeing the possibilities for the first time through a, co a more systemic coalition that is actually focused on getting education to kids rather than holding budgets in government or only serving at for profit. I think this is the future, but we need leaders like Abdel that get us focused on the problem and then help us solve it. So I'm completely agreeing with you and I'm saying, we, we've, we've given up character to win according to conventional methods. And so that's where I keep coming back to the moral revolution. Seems like a good time to tell people where they can get this book. <laughs> Manifesto for a Moral Revolution is available uh, for purchase online. And, uh, and when bookstores reopen again, it will certainly be there. But I also want to mention something that I, I, I believe the value of which has become so evident in this conversation today. And that is that Jacqueline and her team have designed a course on leadership that is based on this book. And this book has very specific ways towards a moral revolution. And you can uh, order that course. It comes actually with the purchase of a book, I think. I am sounding like your PR agent, but I am, are. I am very happy to do so in this case because Karen and I both believe the more people who take this up as their manifesto, take this up as part of their leadership, wherever it is in the world, um, the faster and the closer we will be to a moral revolution, to a just, sustainable, and more equitable world. I want to thank you, Jacqueline Novogratz, for all the work that you do that is leading us there. And Karen, with gratitude for all that you and the Carter Center do as well, um, I'll offer you the final word. Well, thank you, um, Pat, and then I'm going to give it to Karen. I just want to go back to where we started. You know, I started off as a banker, and I said I love how numbers tell a story. And what I love about what you were explaining to me about Radhika, um, Karen, is, you know, moral economy and moral budgets. How we spend our money matters. 
And so I really appreciate this idea that we have to hold each other accountable to, um, to asking ourselves these questions. Are we putting the vulnerable first? And are we ensuring that we integrate them? It's harder to build this way. Um, but this is where we have to go as a world. I feel so lucky to have been part of this conversation with you. Um, President Carter ha had a major impact on my life as well. I got to meet him once in Ethiopia when he was doing voting rights. And, um, and we need more leaders who are unafraid to put our shared humanity at the center in the political realm, the economic realm and the social realm. And as I said, Pat, you've been a hero forever. So this has just been a great thrill for me. And I wish everyone on this line the best of luck in the work that you're doing because it really will take all of us. Well, thank you to you both. Um, it really is a, a great treat for us at the Carter Center to have this discussion. And I want to promise that there will be more. And in fact, Dr. Radhika Balakrishnan, who you just mentioned, hopefully we'll get her on a, a, one of our programs over the summer. And we really do want to explore this idea, these ideas, because we, we really need to innovate now. We need to think new. We need to think, um, we need to find that balance between um, how we act as a collective. Um, and uh, I'm very excited. Thank you for having us. And we look forward to, to more um, of these fascinating discussions. Thank you. Thank you both.